invitation from Maxie and from the eldership here at Brown Trail to speak on the lectureship. The uh, years that I spent here were years that we reflect on fondly, the relationships that we have built, the friendships that are there, and the knowledge that we gain from our time here. As Maxie says, we have a, a little bit of a special relationship. Maxie just became the director of the school the year that I came into school, and so we've had that relationship for about 11 years now, and I appreciate and love him for that. As time marches on, clearly we see that man is drifting farther and farther away from God. I've been assigned a topic, and I'm speaking on a topic about an influence upon society that had its beginning at least during the period of the Reformation and the Enlightenment. We're looking at a topic called humanism, which in essence is a result of a process of suppressing religious principles and enthroning the whims and the fancies of man in regard to how we are to see things in this world. God has been dethroned, and man and reason has been enthroned. We must know at the outset that humanism is atheistic. You cannot be a humanist and have any kind of a belief in deity or a standard. Therefore, since it is atheistic, it's opposed to anything that falls under the scope of that which is moral and ethical regarding a single standard for mankind. There have been several different definitions given to humanism. Tim LaHaye, in his book, The Battle for the Mind, defines humanism as man's attempt to solve his problems independently of God. That's a fair definition, but one that I believe is more inclusive is provided by Brother Robert L. Wagner. And he says that humanism is a system of beliefs about humanity which excludes God from reality and makes man the judge of all things. If we look at that standard and we think back into the times of the Old Testament, especially Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. No standard, no system of authority. Man is free to do what he wants to do and has the ability to do. And in essence, we're seeing that as humanism. I believe it's fair, but I also believe there's no better source for determining what humanism is and what they believe than looking at their own documents and see what they say. From the Humanist Manifesto Number 1, written in 1933, we have this quote. The time has come for widespread recognition of the radical changes in religious beliefs throughout the modern world. The time has passed for mere revision of traditional attitudes. Science and economic changes have disrupted the old beliefs. Religions the world over are under the necessity of coming to terms with new conditions created by vastly increased knowledge and experience. In every field of human activity, the vital movement is now in the direction of a candid and explicit humanism. I want to sow this seed in your mind right now because we're going to, to focus on it more importantly here in just a little bit, but John Dewey was one of those who were responsible for the first Humanist Manifesto. There has probably been no man who has or still influences public education more than John Dewey today, and that will shed some light on the topic we'll discuss in just a few moments. In 1973, 40 years later, a second Humanist Manifesto was written. And notice what's written there. Traditional moral codes and new irrational cults both fail to meet the pressing needs of today and tomorrow. False theologies of hope and messianic ideologies, substitutionary new dogmas for old, cannot cope with existing world realities. They separate rather than unite peoples. Brethren, we can't see it any more clearly, any more in black and white, to see that people say that God, a simple standard or a single standard of morality, a single standard by which we all must be governed, does not fit the needs of man today. And we can see the practices show that that is indeed the case. I believe these two quotes represent the attitudes and the approach of that which I perceive to be one of the greatest dangers we're facing today. Because, brethren, we're facing something that is out to completely undermine society. We're facing something that is out to recruit and to destroy our children. And for that reason, we must take notice. I believe that only the ignorant and the naive will deny that humanism has already affected society in the most catastrophic fashion. We're going to see this especially, I believe, regarding public education. 
Many of us here remember their school years, and they remember how things were in school then, but also I believe we're out of touch with what's going on in school today. We're out of touch with the standard that's being used. We're out of touch with the approaches and the agendas that so many have. And I hope to bring several of those things to your attention this morning. As Maxie sent me the invitation to speak, he wanted me to speak on humanism, but he also wanted me to focus in on two major points and two major areas in which humanism has been so effective. One of these is how humanism has affected the ACLU, and the other is how humanism has affected the NEA. First of all, let's look and see then how humanism has affected the ACLU. The ACLU is simply an abbreviation for the American Civil Liberties Union. And we're looking at a, a group that in their own writings describe themselves as the nation's foremost advocate of individual rights, litigating, legislating, and educating the public on a broad array of issues affecting individual freedom in the United States. Clearly put then, these are those who feel themselves to be the defenders of what we have the right to do, what we have the liberty to do, what we can do in our society, and what protects us regarding the views, the opinions, the positions that one may hold. F. Lagarde Smith, in his book, ACLU, The Devil's Advocate, says that they are indeed, quote, the legal, the legal arm of the liberal left, supporting any number of causes that seem to debase the noble ideals of civil libertarianism. We're going to see some things that I believe might shock you because we're going to see some positions that are held that appear to be ludicrous. They seem to be nonsensical, but when we see how deeply entrenched they already are, Nonsensical is not a term that I want to use. Though they make the bold claim to be advocates for civil rights, a casual glance at what they have done over the years, the positions they've held, the cases they have defended, those positions they've upheld, that's the case except for those who oppose their liberal agenda. Those who profess to be the defenders of civil rights will turn on those who manifest a belief in only a single standard, in a most vehement fashion. Looking at their agenda, I want to quote a little bit lengthy quote from Brother Smith's book. He said, it is not simply the wall separating church and state that the ACLU feels compelled, compelled to maintain. In a pluralistic society, there is no threat that either the federal government or any individual state would establish one particular denomination as its official church. The wall that the ACLU is desperate to build higher and higher, brick by brick, is the wall fencing out any religious influence that might dare to inhibit personal moral autonomy. Because moral anarchy and liberal left politics are allies, religion, the common enemy, must be isolated from the public arena in every possible way. Now granted, that is a quote from one who does not believe in the ACLU. One might say, well, he just from the outside taking pot shots at those who are inside and might be reading his own agenda into what they're doing. But we're going, to believe, we're going to see, I believe, from an example of their past that that simply is indeed the case. In 1986, a man named Kenneth Roberts, a fifth grade teacher at Berkeley Gardens Elementary in Denver, Colorado, was eventually taken to court by the local school system. His crime was keeping a Bible in his desk drawer and reading his Bible during his lunch hour, reading his Bible during uh, special reading times, personal reading times. This was not a man that was holding his Bible up in class and quoting passages. This was not a man who was trying to defend what we would see to be the truth and influence in the fifth grade minds in that sense. He was a man who simply on his own personal time was reading a Bible and everybody in the school system knew the Bible was in the desk. His principal, Kathleen Madigan, told him to keep his Bible in his desk during school hours. Don't read it during lunch. Don't read it during your personal reading times. But before class, after class, take it home, whatever there. Not only did she do that, she also had two quote-unquote questionable books taken from the library. The questionable books were the Bible and pictures and the life of Jesus. During the trial, Madigan was called to testify, and she basically said this. She feared that his reading of the Bible in class would set a Christian tone in that classroom. Quite a fear, isn't it? Now, the ACLU, claiming to be the defender of all public rights, defending the right for people to say what they want to say, believe what they want to believe, hold their own opinions, and do so without being chastised and challenged. 
took the side of the school system in defending the rights of the court in favor of the school's actions. When we think about the ACLU, we think about this concept of rights. And, and the ACLU, we're going to see, is clearly humanistic in their philosophy. This again is clearly seen in the comparison of some of the humanistic documents with the practices and the decisions that have been seen with the ACLU down through the years. For example, under the topic democratic society, in the second humanist manifesto, we read this. To enhance freedom and dignity, the individual must experience a full range of civil liberties in all societies. This includes freedom of speech in the press, political democracy, the legal right of opposition to government policies, fair judicial process, notice religious freedom, freedom of association and artistic, scientific and cultural freedom. It also includes a recognition of an individual's right to die with dignity, euthanasia and the right to suicide. We oppose the increasing invasion of privacy by whatever means in both totalitarian and, dem and democratic societies. We should safeguard, extend, and implement the principles of human freedom evolved from the Magna Carta to the Bill of Rights, the Rights of Man, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now, if we were to step outside of this and just look at this document, we would say that's fair. We might not agree with the things that are being said, but in essence what they're saying is we believe people have the right to believe what they want to believe, to practice what they want to practice. And included within that statement is people have the right to religious freedom. They have the right to, to express their views, to hold their views, and to live as they see fit in that sense. But though the freedom of religion and the freedom of speech are both defended in that statement, the practices today and the vehement way in which such things are opposed today shows that they have an outlook on those who would demand a scriptural standard of morality and ethics as to be fair, unfair and unbalanced. Notice several issues in which this is the case. Look at pornography. You know, we can't look at the television. Prime time, I'm talking about. I'm not talking about late night. You can't turn on the television. You can't see a, a, a billboard going down the road. You can't go to the movies without having pornography literally stuffed down your throat. You can't surf the net in the privacy of your own home without stumbling across these, these sites that have been placed where your children can see them. And probably the most twisted of all of these pornographic offerings, that which I see to be the most sick is that which is called simply kitty porn. Just a casual glance, though, at even a single article of the ACU's guidelines manifest a system that would protect the rights of those who would push this filth on our society. For example, in policy number four, addressing the censorship of obscenity, pornography, and indecency, we read this. The ACLU opposes any restraint on the right to create, publish, or distribute materials to adults, or the right of adults to choose the materials they read or view on the basis of obscenity, pornography, pornography excuse me, or indecency. No matter how shocked we may be at this cesspool of entertainment, no matter how much we might be shocked at what we see, especially in this range of kiddie porn, the ACLU is that which protects the rights and pushes for the rights of those who would push that filth on society. Another view that we might look at is that of capital punishment. Now I know that even as a brotherhood, we are divided over the concept of, of, of capital punishment. But I believe where our division is, is on the basis of whether or not the government has the right to mete out the death sentence on anyone. And I've read arguments on both sides. But I doubt seriously that any of us in that position would go so far as the ACLU has gone and what they say regarding this concept of capital punishment. I want to read a quote from the ACLU policy number 239. The ACLU opposes the death penalty because it denies equal protection of the laws, is cruel and unusual punishment, and removes the guarantee of due process of law. But now notice, the death penalty is so inconsistent with the underlying values of our democratic system, the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness, that the imposition of the death penalty for any crime is a denial of civil liberties. Do you notice that statement? The ideal, the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. Can you imagine a group that is protecting the right of one who might be a murderer, a rapist, serial killer, on and on we can go there, 
and they deny the capitalist punishment simply because we have taken away that individual's right to be happy. <laughs> he can't live a happy life. And so capital punishment is to be done away. Oh, there's so much more that can be said even regarding the ACLU. And I realize that this has been but a brief examination of the ACLU. But I believe, again, we can clearly see the humanistic foundations upon which they are built. Hopefully we've been awakened a little bit to this philosophical outlook, to what's going on, to the agenda that we see. And that knowing these things, we can begin to deal with them from that perspective. But secondly, I was asked also to deal with humanism in the NEA. And we see that the NEA, of course, is an area that is involved in public education, and they are also heavily influenced by humanism. You know, I find it both fascinating and sad at the same time to see a complete reversal in the outlook upon spiritual things in public education. In the early years, the Bible held a strong place in the education system. As a matter of fact, in the early years, our country was based squarely upon the, 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 the biblical foundation. The NEA is the National Education Agency, a very strong group regarding what they influence today. In 1857, there were a group of 10 presidents of state teachers associations that met in Philadelphia. And I believe they had a noble purpose in what they were to meet for because what they wanted to do was to get their heads together and see what kind of job they were doing in education. Are we fulfilling our, our, our children's needs? Are we giving them a well-rounded education? Can we look at the results and see that we're doing a good job in what we're doing? But by 1900, there were some 500,000 teachers in this country. And membership in the NEA was only about 2,200 at that time. But regardless of such a small and an apparently harmless beginning, the NEA has grown to be one of the greatest tools in this country for furthering humanistic beliefs. I referenced John Dewey just a while ago, one of the signers of the Humanist Manifesto One, and also a major force for humanism in the education system. I want to read a quote of his, and I want you to understand this change, this reversal in the way things were viewed. Color me naive, color me ignorant, but I believe the, pro the, the, the reason for going to school is to learn something, to learn history, to learn math, to learn science. But notice what John Dewey says. I believe that the social life of the child is the basis of concentration or correlation in all his growing or truth. I believe, therefore, that the true center of correlation on the school subjects is not science nor literature, nor history nor geography, but the child's social activities. Several humanistic documents and other quotes regarding education should be considered. I believe there are many who are either too naive or too apathetic, maybe, to admit the influence of humanism upon public education. We homeschool our children, and so often we see people being defensive when we talk about education. But please notice and, 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 and look at this with an open mind as we go into some of this material. Let's look at some humanistic documents and other quotes by those who are influential in the education system as what their views are. For example, in the document, A Declaration of Independence, A New Global Ethics, under the title of the Ethics of the World Community, we read this. We face a common challenge to develop scientific education on a global scale and an appreciation for critical intelligence and reason as a way to solve human problems and to enhance human welfare. Remember our definition, dethroning God and enthroning man, leaving religious principles out and looking to ourselves for the answers that we see. But did not Jeremiah say in Jeremiah 10, 23, the way of man is not in himself. It is not a man who walked to direct his own steps. In another humanist document, a secular humanist declaration under the topic moral education, we read this. We believe that moral development should be cultivated in children and young adults. We do not believe that any particular sect can claim important values as their exclusive property. Hence, it is the duty of public education to deal with these values. Although children should learn about the history of religious moral practices, these young minds should not be indoctrinated in a faith before they are mature enough to evaluate the merits for themselves. Parents have quit reading these Bible stories to our children. They're not able to deal with it. 
Let's quit sending them to Bible class so they can learn the scriptures and learn biblical principles. Learn about God. Learn about Christ. Learn about their responsibility to God and his word. They're not ready for it. But let's also look at the other shoe. If they are not prepared enough to deal with these things, then why can't we see the fair position? Why cram humanism down their throat if they're not old enough to be able to deal with it? Probably the most distasteful quote that I've read is from a man who is the professor of education in the Faculty of Medicine and Graduate School of Education, Chester Pierce. And he says this, Every child in America entering school at the age of five is mentally ill because he comes to school with certain allegiances toward our founding fathers, our elected officials, toward his parents, toward a belief in a supernatural being, toward the sovereignty of this nation as a separate entity. It's up to you teachers to make all these sick children well by creating the international children of the future. I don't think any more needs to be said with that point. Again, there are far too many more quotes we can look at. There are at least five humanistic documents that are available to anybody anywhere. As a matter of fact, you can look to the NEA website and you can find everything that I'm saying. Every document that I quote is right there in bold print for people to read. But there are at least two more issues that I want to spend a little bit of time discussing. One involves the approach taken to seduce our children to think for themselves rather than follow the instruction provided by their parents. And the other involves the bold steps by some in the educational system to further their humanistic concepts in the areas of sexuality and other moral issues. Looking at the system of values clarification, in the lectureship book from the 6th Annual Shenandoah Lectures, Brother Dick Stanio provides a simple definition for values clarification. He said it's the name for the educational theory which bases all morality, including moral choices, on individual decision. Again, what are we looking at? We're looking at leaving what parents are saying out, leaving what you might have heard in Bible class out, whatever any from, 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 from an older or, or from, a, from a wiser generation might say, crown all those things out of your mind and look at these issues and make up your mind what you believe and what they say. Values clarification is the name for the approach taken by educators today to instill in children the concept of thinking for themselves rather than listening to parents, grandparents, teachers, preachers, elders, and anyone else who might impose upon them the concept of a single standard of morality. Looking at several of these methods, their, their intention is clearly to have children make up their own minds, but it's to be entirely subjective in doing so. Don't quote scripture, don't quote mom or daddy, don't say preacher or elder says... Look within yourself, and based on what you feel, what do you believe? Now, we don't have near the time to deal with it. I believe I've included several things in the lectureship book from Rita Rhodes Ward, who has done an outstanding amount of work on values clarification. And she's provided several lists that, that are given to these teachers to use in, in, a, in a guidebook, a handbook, on how to teach this material. But clearly what the child feels is right is more important than being wrong or right on a given issue. Lastly, we want to move into sexual education. Now, I was public schooled, graduating from high school in 1975. I went to a small school system out in West Texas, had 10 seniors in my senior class, and I went through several sex education classes when I was there in school. But I have never dreamed of facing what our children are facing in the public schooling system today regarding sex education. Who would ever have thought that our public schools would be guilty of teaching the validity of homosexuality and divorce and fornication and abortion? You might say, well, whoa, whoa, Pat, wait a minute. Is that going on? Sure it is. The material is available for anybody to see. We are seeing those who are advocating people to have the right to be homosexuals. Divorce is not seen as that which is dangerous. Fornication and abortion are those things which are to be tolerated lovingly. I'm not saying it's this way in all the school systems. I've dealt with several school teachers in, 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 in presenting material like this in, in, in a Bible class setting. And I fully understand that there are some school systems that it might not be as bad 
It might not be as firmly entrenched as it might be in more metroplex areas. What I'm saying is the foundation upon which the school system is based. That strong lobby group, the NEA, is that which supports and defends and continues to implement ways to have these things taught. Who would ever have dreamed that our children would be provided with a definition of abstinence as anything short of sexual intercourse? Pardon the graphic nature, but masturbation, fondling, oral sex, and other issues are seen as acceptable and are defined as abstinence by those in this position. There's an increasing trend to teach our children that homosexuality is acceptable behavior. I know of no other issue that is going to grow any larger, is going to be any more dangerous that we're going to have to deal with than the wholesale social acceptance of homosexuality today. One matter of great concern that I have is in the form of a video that has been produced by two women, Helen Cohen and Deborah Chasnoff, entitled, It's Elementary, Talking About Gay Issues in School. Donald Wildman, the editor of the American Family Association magazine, has done an outstanding amount of work regarding the issues that I'm talking about this morning. But in regard to just these two women, he has a good deal to say to enlighten us as to what's happening. For example, notice this quote. He says, Chasnoff has this to say about her video. What's clear in the film is the younger the kids, the more open they are. If we could start doing this kind of education in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, we'd have a better generation. Do we see an agenda, brethren? He goes on to say this. The principal of an elementary school says on the video, I don't think it's appropriate that values only be taught at home. There are social values as well. There are community values. I've only got one question. What standard are they going to use to teach these values in the school system? And what are they going to deny as being credible? In the same article in which these quotes are found, Wildman indicates that this video has already received public acclaim because it received the CINE Golden Eagle for the best teacher film of 1999. He also says that the video has already been screened in six states and California Assemblywoman Sheila J. Cool, an open lesbian, said she intends to have it shown in all 50 states. I want to take just a couple of moments before I begin to wind this up, because after I completed and sent in the manuscript, I continued to look at some information. And I found the NEA website, and I wanted to read a couple of quotes, especially based on sexual education, from their own words. For example, I have here an amendment that was passed on July 6, 1995, regarding homosexuality. The National Education Association recognizes the importance of raising the awareness and increasing the sensitivity of staffs, students, parents, and the community to sexual orientation in our society. The association therefore supports the development of positive plans that lead to effective ongoing training programs for education employees for the purpose of identifying and eliminating sexual orientation stereotyping in the educational setting. Such programs should attend to but not be limited to a accurate portrayal of the roles and contributions of gay, lesbian, and bisexual people throughout history with acknowledgement of their sexual orientation. B, the acceptance of diverse sexual orientation and the awareness of sexual stereotyping whenever sexuality and or tolerance of diversity is taught. C, elimination of sexual orientation name calling and jokes in the classroom. And D, support for the celebration of a lesbian and gay history month as a means of acknowledging the contribution of lesbians, gays, and bisexuals throughout history. I hope that you who are on the internet will go home when we leave. All you've got to do is type into the address line NEA and you'll get where I want you to go. And I want you to see a document that is available, it's about 17 pages long, that as I speak is being sent to every school system in the country. And it's simply entitled, Just the Facts About Sexual Orientation and Youth. A primer for principals, educators, and school personnel. This came to my attention when we read the Birmingham newspaper one day. One of our members, is, uh, one of our elders, is also works for the school system there in Millport. 
And he indicated in this article how this has already been being sent out to the churches in Alabama. It's just a matter of time before the churches in the metro Metroplex will get it as schools, excuse me, in the Metroplex will get it as well. But one of those who sponsor this is the National Education Association. And I have just a couple of quotes that I want to read because what they're trying to do, there are already, from what I understand, certain programs in place to deal with these young people who come out of the closet. And my understanding is the programs are designed to get them to change their lifestyle and to live a normal sexual life. That is not the approach of this document. For example, on page four, because of their legitimate fear of being harassed or hurt, gay, lesbian, or bisexual youth are less likely to ask for help. Thus, it is important that their environments be as open and accepting as possible so these young people will feel comfortable sharing their thoughts and concerns. To be able to provide an accepting environment, school personnel need to understand the nature of sexual orientation development and be supportive of healthy development for all youth. Looking at one of the ministries, it's called the Transformational Ministry, and this is a ministry that I understand that they use spiritual principles to show them that homosexuality is unacceptable. And it says this, Although Transformational Ministry promotes the message that religious faith and acceptance of gay, lesbian, and bisexual sexuality are incompatible, that message is countered by the large number of outspoken clergy and people of faith who promote love and acceptance. They go on to say in the document, I wish I had the time to deal with more of it, that it's almost of a threatening nature. They show that people can be held legally responsible for violating people's rights and teaching them that homosexuality is unacceptable. Quickly as we're running out of time, what can we do and what must we do? You know, it's one thing to deal with the information. It's one thing to have all the information brought before us so that we can look at it it's one thing for us to acknowledge that this is going on, but as children of God, what must we do? And if we can't answer that question, then we wasted our time to this point. I believe there are some improper approaches to what we must do. Brethren, we must not simply just wring our hands in despair. It's here. It's firmly entrenched. It's in every single environment, every single society that I know of. But brethren, Satan has always been a powerful adversary. Satan has always tried to find that one area where he can step in and, and to divide peoples and, 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 to, and to separate people from God. But brethren, victory is assured. It's always been assured. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 and 58, Paul says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We must not merely ignore the problem. Brethren, it's not going to go away. Nothing of this dangerous problem is just simply going to run its course and leave. We must continue to exert influence upon society. Christ says in Matthew 5, 14, 16, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor that he light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Brethren, we cannot be immobilized by fear. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 1.7 that fear is not from God. God has given us the power. We must also continue to believe in the power of the gospel, Romans 1.16-17. Briefly, we see three appropriate actions we must take. First, brethren, we must be willing to boldly challenge the lies of the humanist regarding their perceived lack of a moral standard. History is replete from one page to the other with horror stories of those who have believed they could look within and find their own way. We already referenced Judges 21-25 and what went on there and what was the result of people finding their own way. Proverbs 14, 12 says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof is a way of death. We see some good people, some sincere people, some people that might fully believe what they say, but as they leave God out of the loop, as they avoid and reject God's revealed word to us, they place themselves simply by that action in a precarious situation. Brethren, there is a single standard of morality, and we must proclaim that message from the rooftops. 
Secondly, we must realize and act upon the truth that the responsibility of instilling moral values in our children does not lie in the education system. We don't send our children to school to learn the moral values. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Brethren, what we have in society today, to a great extent, is some spineless parents who are not doing their jobs, who are in essence washing their hands of their responsibility and looking to the school system to raise their children for them. Brethren, in the church, we're not immune. We have parents in our own congregations who, who wash their hands in the matter and look to Bible class teachers to instill values in their children, to look at the elders and say, it's your job to train my child. It's your job to train my child to keep him interested. And if you can't, then I'm going to go elsewhere. We must have parents who know what their children are learning, who are interested in our children's spiritual well-being. Do we know what they're being taught in Bible class? Do we look at the material when it comes in? Do we talk to the teachers and understand what's going on? Brethren, it's our job to raise them. Finally, we must realize that remaining passive or inactive has never been an appropriate response. So many times we say, well, somebody needs to do something. Anybody, somebody needs to stand up and do something here. And what we're essentially saying is, I'm not going to do it. You step up and take care of it. One of the most sad commentaries in all of Scripture is found, I believe, in the refusal of some to stand and make a difference. Brother Max, he did a manuscript and a lectureship book several years back from Ezekiel 2230. So I sought for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it. The sad commentary, but I found no one. Brethren, shame on us if that be the legacy we leave. Shame on us if someone looked back and said, well, no one stood up and defended God's word in this sense. Brethren, in conclusion, we must realize that we cannot take our Christianity off at the door of the voting booth. Now, I know I'm, I'm going from preaching to meddling here. When we take our place in the voting booth, as we analyze the candidates that we are to cast our vote for, I fully believe that a vote for a candidate who openly holds these views, regardless of what might be our intention of doing so, is a vote for that view to be furthered in his time of office. If I know that there is a man who is pro-abortion, if I know that there is a man who is humanistic to the very core, if I know a man who openly favors gay and lesbian relationships, when I put my check by his name on that ballot, I, in essence, am voting for that to continue in his time there. Some, like my wife and I, have opted to educate our children at home. We've been homeschooling for about seven years now. I realize that that's not required for everyone. We don't openly campaign for this to occur, but I do know that it's worked well for us. Regardless, we must be aware of what our children are being taught in our schools, and we must instill in them the only standard by which they will be judged. If we start with our children at a young age, if we thoroughly indoctrinate them in Scripture, if we give them a healthy diet of God's Word, brethren, they're going to have those tools to use when they confront these things in school. If we're aware that it's going on, let's talk to them about it. Let's deal with these issues. Let's be open with them. And let's give them that which they need to counter this heresy. Finally, brethren, we must be those who speak out whenever and wherever we have the opportunity. Far too long we have seen congregations, individual members who have looked to elderships and preachers as being the ones who need to get the job done. Brethren, you're going to come into contact with more people than I ever will. As Maxie's working in the pulpit here, he's going to deal with a lot of people. But we're looking at, 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 at a group of 400 and some odd people who have their own circle of those that they deal with, their own peer group. You will deal with more people and can be of more good, more influence. In that sense, by openly speaking God's word. Brethren, let's not be like those ten spies who came back with a faithless report. We can't. Let's have more men and women with the faith and courage of Joshua and Caleb who boldly live their lives with assurance based on the promises that God has made for every generation. Thank you.